Peace to you and welcome back to church. The seating is kind of upside down today because we have a camera in the middle, but we'll adjust. I'm all wired up. Um, if you saw the video last week, then right after the sermon, I turned this mic off, which is the mic that goes to the camera, and that turned off the sound altogether for the camera, and that was that. Um, we don't know why, so this mic is just always on. So everything you do will be picked up by the camera. Anyhow, a couple of announcements. Um, ben Lincoln's World continues. I finally took the time to read this. The next one is October 25th, two weeks from now. And we have a J. Ritchie Garrison. He's University of Delaware. He's going to give us a guide to the architectural nature of the Ben Lincoln House. So if you want to know anything about how it was built, how it is built, that's a good one to go to. And they're all online. And go to the Historical Society for tickets. Also, we have the food pantry in the corner over there. And right next to it now, we have space for Father Bill's uh, material stuff. They need things like all the time. Here's a wish list for what they need. It's also posted on the wall out there. And it's basic stuff like shaving items, razors, hair brushes, shampoo, um, socks, men and women, um, linens for kid beds. You know, it's just uh, the, all the needs that people need all the time. So we'll be doing that. That's our, our latest new outreach ministry. And speaking of outreach, today we have, you can see here we have an outreach offering and our regular weekly offering. We'll collect those at the end as we leave. The, the one path, you know, nobody's facing each other kind of thing. So this one, we've got the outreach offering in the first plate. The weekly offering is next. And hand sanitizer flowers and snacks just as you go you just hit them all that's all i have anything else from out there how's well, we'll get back to you i'm jumping ahead please rise as you are able and join me in our call to worship oh give thanks to the lord for he is good for his steadfast love and yours forever Happy are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you deliver them, that I may glory in your heritage. Our ancestors sinned. They made a calf at Horeb and worshiped a cast image. They forgot God, their savior, who had done great things in Egypt wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Blessed be the Lord our God from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Amen. Join me now in our prayer for the day, spoken as one. Ever-present God, you never leave us. Keep us seeking after that which is true, that all may know that you are the Lord, our God, a steadfast presence in our lives. And we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Now, as I mentioned, we'll... Our first reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, 
and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are our gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. A second reading comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 22. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe, and he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Here ends our readings. Oh, we got trouble. Terrible, terrible trouble. With a capital T, that rhymes with P, and that stands for parable. <laughs> with apologies to Meredith Wilson. Last week, we spoke about how this series of three parables would get more and more violent. And this is number three, and it's pretty gruesome. We sometimes forget that Jesus lived in a dangerous time and that his lessons were not always easy to hear. 
we would much rather hear about a miracle or even an interesting dinner with untouchables. This is not the case today, and neither is it the case with Moses and the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai. Why would Jesus tell this parable? Why would the Israelites abandon Moses and make a golden calf, for that matter? What is going on? The Bible is supposed to be inspirational. It's not supposed to make us cringe, is it? In this parable, Jesus leaves us with some dead slaves, a burned city, a bunch of people who are compelled to go to a party, a guest expelled from said party because his wardrobe was lacking. Is this what the kingdom of heaven is like? Notice that the only ones doing what the king commands are the slaves and the troops. Notice also that the banquet goes on. The king is, after all, the king. Of the original invitees, one went to his farm and another to his business. Why would Matthew point that out? Perhaps because whatever kind of farm it was, agricultural, animals, crops, whatever, it would be okay on its own for a day or so. So that guy could have gone to the banquet if he wanted to. But the one who went to his business, the Greek word used by Matthew was emporia, which could mean a marketplace or merchandise. The bottom line is this guy would rather be doing business, making money. In his second letter, Peter used the same word, but in a different context. He used it to mean exploit with deception. Throughout the Bible, merchants were sketchy characters. Deuteronomy says we should give only a full and honest measure, that we should only use honest weights so that your days will be long. The prophet Amos condemned merchants who practiced deceit with false balances and who sold chaff and called it wheat. This is why today's parable calls out merchants, because more often than not, they had earned their bad reputation. The farmer who didn't trust God to look after his crops for a few days, and the merchant who only wanted to make money, represent a particular kind of sinner and deserve special attention, at least to Matthew and Jesus. At the end, the slaves gathered both good and bad and filled the wedding hall. Would the bad be included in the kingdom of heaven? They weren't even chosen. They were gathered in only to fill empty seats. It looks as if the covenant relationship between king and subjects is broken, because otherwise, would you refuse your king and expect to get away with it? So what kind of king is this? How does the kingdom of heaven compare to him? Jesus usually says the kingdom of heaven is like something, like a landowner or a mustard seed, or yeast. But here, he compares it to a king no one likes and who will resort to violence to get what he wants. Remember that Jesus is speaking to the chief priests and Pharisees. So again, we wonder, what kind of parable is this? Is this a parable about salvation? If so, then where is free will? The book of Sirach addresses choice saying, if you choose, you can keep the commandments and to act faithfully is a matter of your own choice. He has placed before you fire and water. Stretch out your hand for whichever you choose. Before each person are life and death and whichever one chooses will be given. So the parable is probably not about that. The people in the first century knew about keeping the commandments. So is the parable about God's grace? If so, then why burn down the entire city simply because a few people sinned? It can't be about the messianic banquet at the end times because this is a banquet where no one eats. If the king here is supposed to be God, then who would want to worship such a God? 
But if we heard this parable not as being about the kingdom of heaven, but about human kings, politics, violence, and the absence of justice, it's different. The people who heard these stories from Jesus paid attention. Let anyone with ears listen. They were challenged. They were provoked. They were, were reminded, perhaps, of their own sorry situations. And in some way, maybe, that they, maybe they were convinced that the way things were for them were not the way things should be at all. Maybe this parable serves as a reminder that God had originally invited the ancient Israelites to be God's people, to be an example to all the nations. Aaron fashioned a golden calf with a graving tool, according to the King James Version. That calf represented Yahweh to the people in the form of a God they could see, but they had made it for themselves. The people shaped God according to their own desires. They had been quick to turn aside from the way God commanded in the 10 words we heard last week. And that almost brought disaster to them until Moses intervened, begging God to change his mind, which God did. Even God can relent. Interestingly, with God now out in front of them in the form of a golden idol, clearly breaking commandments one and two, they rejoiced. They made a festival to the Lord and feasted. So surely that can't be all bad. But is the presence of an idol necessary to prompt joy in the human heart? No. The Israelite sin was in having a limited vision of God. We know people who will not approach the communion table thinking that they are somehow unworthy, that whatever their sin may be, it's so bad that it precludes God's forgiveness and reconciliation. We also know people who are afraid of Hebrew scripture because they believe the God of Moses is a mean God, a hairy thunderer, if you will, ever ready to incinerate us all. They prefer the kind and gentle God with us that they see in Jesus. And we all know people who believe their idea of God is incompatible with ours. In fact, I know a chaplain who once encountered such a person in a hospital. The patient was adamant that her God was nothing like my friend's God and that her God was the one true God. So my friend said, tell me about your God. And the woman launched into a long exposition about her God. At the end, she said, Jesus-like, what do you think? My friend said, your God sounds a lot like my God. And that broke down a wall, and the two then began talking about life and everything else on an even footing, simply because they shared this one common understanding. Would that have been the case if the woman's God were a golden calf? Misunderstandings abound in the Bible, as they do in the modern world. Take today's Exodus reading as an example. In verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. But then Moses said to God, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt? In reality, the escape from Egypt was a co-production. And Moses knew that it was only by God's mighty hand that they all made it out alive. So for God and Moses, there was a lot of gray area. Their shared understanding of the event was incomplete. God saw it in one way, and Moses saw it in another, and the people saw it in yet a third way. What we know about God would fill a teacup. Yet the person who avoids the communion table because of his sin believes that God has judged him and written him off. And the people who are frightened of the God of Moses, whose wrath sometimes burns hot, 
might be surprised to find that God is also reasonable and that God keeps promises. And if your idea of God is so limited that there is no room for my vision of God alongside yours, God just might send someone to help open your eyes. Matthew's gospel shows a lot of concern for the kingdom of heaven and how we might perceive it. His concerns perhaps should be our concerns. Jesus' parables are lessons to teach us, yes, but they sometimes expose us to ugly truths that lie just below the surface, as we saw today. But the whole point, the good news, is that God loves us and wants us to live in peace right here and now. God also wants us to know that we all have a seat at the banquet if we choose to go. And God will wait for us to decide because God's steadfast love endures forever. Amen. You might not know how much fun it is for me to pick up these readings week to week and go, oh boy, <laughs> what are we going to do with this? Marion. I, I can go along with the first parable and the second parable. The third parable I have trouble with. You've talked about this. Trouble, trouble, trouble. Terrible trouble. Right. You've talked about it before. I know. I can't quite remember this. Um, are there do other documents that indicate that the king is meant to be a earthly king, not the one who throws people into the darkness because of what they're wearing? Uh, is that made clear anywhere, or is that... The parable is it's a self-contained unit. I mean, in other writings about it, because it just... About that parable? Well, like I said, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven may be compared to, compared favorably to, the king who does this. And it could be an earthly king. It may, I don't think it's an allegory, so I think he's talking about an earthly king who does this stuff because he burns the city and does all these. But if you looked at it as a divine king and the, the, the banquet at the end times and all that, Still, the kingdom of heaven compares to that. We don't want that. No. You know, the kingdom of heaven is this. And Jesus is trying to get our attention by saying, speaking, he's talking to the chief priests and Pharisees. Remember, and right after this, they all look at him and they, they talk among themselves and plan to kill him. They've had it. Yeah. This isn't a lesson he's throwing out on the mountain to the people or to the disciples. Be a little clearer. <laughs> well, that's the, the problem with reading you know, little bits and pieces every Sunday, and I'm, I'm trying to string them together. This all started, this is the week Jesus entered Jerusalem. He rode in on the donkey, Hosanna to the King of David, all that. This is what he's doing in the temple, and this is when the chief priests and Pharisees have had it, and they plot to kill him, because he's teaching these things to them. You have done this. You have not held up your end. He's not saying any of this to the people or to the disciples. He's skewering these guys. So that's why it's a hard lesson. Because it's... it's yeah. And last week, they did figure it out that he was talking about them, and that made them angry. And then he tells them this one, and then they plot to kill him. And you know, that's the next step. And then everything goes south after that. So that's why these are difficult for us to read because we think, oh, Jesus is you know, not a hippy-dippy kind of guy, but Jesus is a gentle God. He's, he's, you know, he's not going to tell stories like this, but he does because he's telling it to these guys. You have done this. 
I think it was so clear they decided he had to die. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so he's saying it compares, it compares to why wouldn't it, I'm not seeing, seeing where you're coming up with the earthly king. I understand he's an earthly king, but yep. he's saying it compares, so there's got to be some. It, you could look, you could look at it. it yeah, right? you, you could elevate it that way. Yeah. But. I think he, because he's talking to the chief priests, they're going to hear it as an earthly king doing all this and the banquet and all that. But when he talks about the outer darkness and everything else, that could be the divine king in end times and everything. They could look at it that way. But remember, he said compares, not like. There's a difference there. He's putting a little spin on it. Tough love. <laughs> yep. God is tough love. And if you don't like it, <laughs> it's your choice, right? Yep. Yeah. You can choose. Ed. One thing is that because we're all broken, what we need is a savior. So we will be between us and our Because we're all going to do something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but, but, so what we need is Jesus. Yeah, Moses intervened in the Exodus story. Jesus is intervening here because the chief priests and Pharisees are doing harm. And he's trying to stop them. And he, or at least tell them, you know, you've done this and you've got to fix it. Because you can't always fix it. So you're right. He's, he's stepping in for us. Ratio. didn't mention it, but there, Aaron says, give me your gold, you know, your, your earrings and, and whatnot. That's their wealth. People wore their wealth. You know, like women always, for their wedding dowry, they would just carry these massive necklaces and rings and baubles and everything. And that would be their wealth. And it was theirs forever. Whatever they could literally carry into the, the marriage, that was their wealth even if it was tucked away in a box later. So he's, Aaron's saying, give me all your personal wealth and I'll make this calf. So everything they have is focused on this calf so they can have something tangible to look at. Like our, our gnome here. You got to go back and, and look at the videos and see what's up with the gnome. He's still for sale, by the way. Make me an offer. Kind of take the parallels. Another instance where the Lord has to step in and make corrections. Now, whenever I make something, I do more work with the eraser than I do with pointing it. So you never get anything straight, correct, from the onset. Now, here's my question: and what's going on? Are there discussions amongst perhaps conservative clergy? This is a correction that's being imposed. This what? Well, send a virus down. Thin the flock. Get rid of some of the things that have really worked out. Look at all the discord. Maybe we really need to scare these people into <laughs> believing something. There are so those I who believe that. Place, yeah. I, I, I mean, you open up the newspaper and it's talking political subjects. 
every once in a while you find a little article about how a church or a parish gets peripherally involved. But, with all of the congregations, whether they're attended or not, is there this discussion of merging? That this is a correction? I'm sure there are lots of pastors wondering about that and thinking about it, sure. And there's lots of congregants thinking that because it's just such a big pile of stuff this year. Yeah. You know, it, it's... Is there any literature of things being published, perhaps advancing? Probably, depending on where you look, yeah. There's, there are publications all over the place that address every different slice of conservative, you know, conservatives to liberals, you know, all along the way, there's people talking about everything all the time. So, yeah. Well, people make jokes by saying, is this the elephant in the living room? That which nobody dares speak of, but is terribly obvious to everybody. Could be. If you're online and you look at, like, Facebook, there are memes, that, you know, little images with you know, captions on them. One of my favorites is, you know, how the, everything has been postponed. The Kentucky Derby, I think, is going to run in November, for example, and the, the Masters is coming up soon. But this is a, a hazy, foggy photo of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and the caption is something like, contestants, Kentucky Derby 2020. So, yeah, people are thinking along those lines. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. We just have to wait and see. Sometimes you don't know until you have hindsight and you can look at it. But if it is, shape up might be the message. Everybody get back on track. If that's the case, then we're woefully off track. So get back on it. You never know. Okay, thank you. I think our readings are still with Exodus and Matthew next week, so, <laughs> oh boy. So we're at the point now, um, we're almost done. And again, with the offerings, we already did our prayer of dedication for the outreach. That's the first plate. Second plate is the weekly offering hand sanitizer for those who came in a little early or a little late. There's flowers and then snacks on the way out. And we all go out this way, single file, etc., as usual. Okay? So let's now do, in one voice, our prayer of dedication for the weekly offering. And then we'll have both covered. We give you thanks and praise, Lord, for the free and abundant gift of grace you have given us in Jesus Christ. Let the simple gifts of our lives be a sign of our unending gratitude for your steadfast love. Amen. Now, a benediction is supposed to be good words, literally, as we exit. May we all stay healthy. May we all keep smiling. And may we all see God at work around us. And may those who see us see God at work in us. May the love of God, the breath of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of Jesus Christ be with us all, always. Amen.